Pentecost, the birthday of the church, is also a type of the rapture of the church. here to talk with me about one of my favorite topics, that is the Jewish Festival of Pentecost, is Bob Ulrich. Hi, Bob. Gary, good to be with you. You have written an exciting article in the June issue of the Prophecy Watcher magazine. And I'm holding it up right here, and, and later we're going to talk about what's on page 23 of this magazine. But right now, we're going to talk about page 4, Pentecost, a picture of the rapture. You know, Bob, it's been many years. Uh, probably 25 years ago, that we, be, we first began to write about this idea, uh, noticing that the Jewish festivals uh, all had fulfillments uh, that were prophetic in nature. And when you look at the Jewish festivals, you know, you're starting with Passover, uh, of course the Lamb of God, unleavened bread, Jesus is the bread of life, first fruits, Christ is the first fruits of them who slept, and then you count 50 days after first fruits and you come to Pentecost. First fruits and Pentecost always occur on the first day of the week, a Sunday. And of course the church was born on, for, on uh, Pentecost that first day of the week. Well, I find it interesting that you're talking about Judaism. I mean, yeah. we're Christians and we're talking about Judaism today. You know, there's something called the Feast Days of Israel. Right. that we really follow very, very closely and have over the years. In fact, you know, there's a best-selling book out right now on the rapture of the church, except it's not on the rapture of the church. It's against the rapture of the church. And what's really ironic about the book, I think it's the number one best-selling book on Amazon right now, is it never mentions the nation of Israel. That's it never right. talks about Israel and the plan of God. And of course, we are both fierce defenders of the rapture of the church and the nation of Israel, mm -hmm. and God's plans for them into the future. And some of these plans revolve around the Jewish feast days. They do, and I have my Bible open to Colossians uh, that uh, uh, clearly points out an idea that's basic to what we're talking about. Colossians chapter 2, uh, when Christ died on the cross, the following uh, was commented, uh, the following verses commented upon Christ's death, burial, and resurrection in this way. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And then here uh, Paul's speaking about the law. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, let no man uh, judge you in meat, drink, or in respect of a holy day or a new moon or a Sabbath uh, or the, of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And this is one of the most concise statements of what we're talking about. The, uh, the festival calendar is a shadow of things to come. In other words, what Paul's really saying here is the festival calendar of Israel is a prophecy. It has prophetic stages or steps. And there have been prophecies that have been fulfilled in the past, and there are feast day prophecies that will yet be fulfilled in the future. Lying right in the middle of those seven feast days lies the Feast of Pentecost, which we believe has tremendous prophetic significance. Indeed, and that's uh, what the article is all about. Uh, you know, uh, Pentecost is an amazing festival, and it, I first became sensitized to the importance of it <clears throat> when I noted and, and it's been a long time ago now, I, I first noted that uh, after the flood and, and the earth dried out, Noah came down to earth and he began to do what was necessary to restart civilization after the flood and God gave him a new covenant, a post-flood covenant, it's called the Noahic covenant. And I noticed that the date was right around the time that later became known as Pentecost, uh, around Sivan the sixth. Now, as we're going to discuss later, uh, Pentecost is called the festival without a date. It has a shifting date in the Jewish calendar. It's a mysterious festival. 
It always occurs on the first day of the week, but, but in the Jewish calendar, the first day of the week shifts back and forth depending upon the sighting of the new moon and the cal calculation of each year's calendar. So you can come close to Pentecost, but you can never just nail it down to the, to the moment, that is, to the time when the stars are a certain way or the moon is a certain way. It shifts from year to year. Well, the Noahic Covenant was given on if you will, Pentecost, even though Pentecost hadn't been, been uh, designated as such yet and wouldn't be until uh, Moses received the law. Well, that sounds like no man knows the day or the hour. It does. Now, let me get you in a little trouble. That's my specialty is getting you in uh -oh. a little hot water. There's some people out there who believe that the church was born on Pentecost as evidenced in Acts chapter 2. But there's another group of people who say that the church was actually born on Mount Sinai 3,500 years ago uh, when God gave the law to the Israelites. How do you address that? When did the church come into being and what's the difference between those two well, events? Well, it's fascinating. And it, it, since you've mentioned this, I'm going to turn my Bible back to Exodus 19, <clears throat> the giving of the law. And if you turn to the, the very uh, beginning of Exodus 19, verse 1, in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, well, that is the month of Sivan. And the month of Sivan, the sixth day, actually it can be the fifth, sixth, or seventh of Sivan because uh, Pentecost is a festival without a date. But the children of Israel gathered at Mount Sinai in the third month, month of Sivan. And then when you read on uh, in uh, Exodus 19, 15, uh, the Lord tells Moses to be ready on the third day. That would be the third of Sivan. Came to pass the third day in the morning there were thunders and lightnings. Well, this whole business of giving the law took place during the time that, that later became known as Pentecost, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth of Sivan. And so the law was given on Pentecost. And again, it was given in such a way that you couldn't really be certain about a date. Uh, again, it's very important, in my opinion, to recall that the, the uh, Festival of Pentecost is most clearly known among the Jews as the festival without a date. Now, here we have in Exodus 19 <clears throat> a very important Pentecost. When the trumpet sounded and the law was given to the people on Pentecost. So, is this the birthday of the church? No, it's a type of the birthday of the church. Because what Pentecost turns out to be, as you study it throughout the Bible, <clears throat> is, a, is a type of the, a, a steep change, if you will, a sea change from one form uh, of, uh, or lifestyle to another form or lifestyle using a familiar term, from one dispensation to the next dispensation. The change is always on a Pentecost. Well, I love the passages in Scripture that they refer to as shadows of things to come. Uh, you know, comparing sometimes Scripture and Scripture, you can see uh, these analogies that work back and forth. I've got a, a little paper here that I found on the Internet that I just thought was just completely fascinating because it covers the similarities to what happened uh, when the Jews were given the law, and what happened in Acts chapter 2 when the church was born. Mm -hmm. And it, I'm going to take the time to read this because I think it's that important. And, and I do too. I, I love it. It's a very compact recitation. Parallels are, are really fascinating. They are. First one, both events occurred on a mountain, one in Mount Sinai, one on Mount Zion, known as the mountain of God. Both events happened to a newly redeemed people. The Exodus marked the birth of the Israelite nation, while Pentecost events recorded in Acts 2 mark the birth of Christianity. Both events involve God's people receiving a gift, the Torah, or the law, and the Holy Spirit. Both events, the gift was given by God, settling on a mountain with the fire of His Spirit. Certainly, you know, the fires and thunderings and lightnings and things that came out of Mount Sinai, the Bible describes as terrifying. When the Holy Spirit came down, there were yeah. tongues of fire that settled on the people. Right. Both events took place at the same time, on the same month. Can't mm -hmm. possibly be a coincidence, can it? The Israelites left Egypt on Passover. Forty days later they arrived at Sinai. 
Moses went up in the mountain to see God. Ten days later, Moses came down from the mountain with the law, the Torah, and the Israelites broke the covenant, the altar of the golden calf, and 3,000 people died that day. Well, ten days after Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit came down in Acts chapter 2 when Peter preached the gospel. Right. <clears throat> 3,000 people were saved. So we have this 3,000 died, 3,000 were saved. Fifty days after sacrificing the Passover lamb, the Israelites received a covenant from God. Fifty days after sacrificing Jesus on the cross, our Passover lamb, believers received a new covenant from God. Both events had similar sounds and symbols, wind, fire, smoke, voices. The Hebrew word translated thunder is kolot, uh, which means voices or languages. And then you look at Acts chapter 2, and you see how everyone, mm -hmm. the disciples, spoke in everyone's own language. Absolutely. And all these people who were in Jerusalem were saved that day because they could hear the gospel in their own language. Uh, both events had theophanies where God showed up. Uh, both events, God gave His Torah to His people. Both cases, He sealed the covenant that He made with them. At Sinai, He gave the law written by His own fingers on tablets of stone. At Pentecost, He gave the law written on tablets of the heart. That's enough, isn't it? Listen, that'll, that's a good beginning. But, but the thing is, in each of those cases, you have a change from one, if you will, dispensation or style of living or administration to a different uh, dispensation or style of living or administration. They, Pentecost marks the change. Uh, you think of the fire on the mountaintop. Uh, you go back to Exodus 19, fire came down on the mountain. And there's a huge difference between that and Acts chapter 2 where fire came down as little tongues of flame that touched each uh, uh, believer on that day. And in fact, when you read Acts chapter 2, you read that the day of Pentecost had fully come. And that you'll find that expression in the King James. Now, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, meaning... <clears throat> that the Jews had stayed up all night, as was their custom, studying, praying, reading. The next morning, they received a, a spiritual blessing, and it was morning. In fact, in Acts, it says it was about 9 o'clock in the morning when they left their room and went out in the street and started amazing people uh, who heard, heard them speaking in their own languages. And so something big had happened on that particular Pentecost. You, yeah. um, you just used an important word that not everyone may understand, the word dispensation. To some people, that's a four-letter word. Yeah, and really it, it, it's uh, a word that means administration. <clears throat> God works at various times and various places down through history in different administrations. The administration of, uh, of uh, the calling, for example, of Abraham. The call of Abraham <clears throat> was the administration of promise, in which Abraham received a series of promises. Now the law hadn't been given yet, but the promises given to Abraham were promises uh, in which God covenanted with Abraham, saying, I'm going to give you this, 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 and this. All this looked forward to the law, which came the days of Moses, and of course Moses at the mountaintop uh, on, if you will, on Pentecost, before it was called Pentecost, because it wasn't even called that until after the law was written, uh, was given a new administration. That administration lasted all the way up until the time of Christ. Christ came and offered Himself and was rejected, and the next administration occurred on a Pentecost. And we're still in that administration. Now, it's called a dispensation, but you can also call it an administration. When I think of the word <laughs> dispensationalism, which is a big, long word that very few people know what it means, I think of people who believe in the rapture of the church. And I think of people who believe in the covenant with Israel and the separation between Israel and the church. At some point down the road, we'll all be together. Mm -hmm. But there's a period of time, as evidenced in the Bible, where the church and the nation of Israel follow different pathways and yet eventually, when Christ returns, they meet in the middle. Now, there's something fascinating, and I cover this in my article. There's something fascinating about the Jewish uh, observance of, of Pentecost, which, by the way, is called in Hebrew Shavuot, which means weeks. 
because from first fruits, that is the resurrection of Christ, seven weeks elapse plus one day. That, that's a total of 50 days. <clears throat> and so this Feast of Weeks to the Jews is a time of, of great inner soul searching. It comes to a culmination on Pentecost. On the 50th day it is the custom of modern Jews to stay up all night. That is they would stay up all night Saturday and they would then witness the sunrise on Sunday morning. Well, shades of Acts chapter 2. That's what the disciples did. But the Jews have a belief. They study a series of readings, very special readings that are dedicated to the time of Pentecost. And they stay, all, uh, stay up all night and, and read uh, this group of, of scriptures that are called Tikkun Leil Shavuot, which means readings for the night of Pentecost. And they believe that if they're very, very diligent and very, very spiritual on that night, at some point during the night, and nobody knows when, the skies will open for a brief instant and they will receive a particular blessing from God. And this they call taharot, which means uh, an infusion of spirituality from on high. <clears throat> and so they remember this each Pentecost. Does this sound familiar to you? The heavens open for a brief instant. Right. It kind of brings me back to the words of uh, John in the book of uh, Revelation chapter 4 where he says, and I saw a door opened in heaven. Yeah. A brief instant, perhaps that door will open and one day we'll be raptured. Well, I began to, to, to look at these things uh, a long time ago, maybe 25 years ago, and I began to write on this subject. And <clears throat> I first began to note that Pentecost was a type of the rapture. Is it more than a type of the rapture? Could it be possible that the, that the rapture will occur on a future Pentecost? And of course, uh, I have uh, I've written about this for years, and other people have picked up the, 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 the torch and began to write about it too. Well, as Christians, we believe that the minute we're raptured and taken to heaven to spend eternity with Jesus, what's the first thing that happens after we get to heaven, or certainly one of the first things that happens? We're judged by Jesus yes. on the things we've done in our life, whether they be good or bad. And of course, what do the Jews believe about that? They believe Pentecost is the day the fruit of the trees is judged. That's right. And we're not judged <clears throat> on our sins when we get to heaven. Okay? Our sins are banished by the cross of Christ. We're judged on our works and the things we've done in our body. By their fruit you shall know them. By their fruit you shall know them. And this is what the Jews believe about Pentecost. The judgment of the fruit of the trees. So in every way Pentecost is a display of God's grace. The gifts that He gives to men are, are especially magnified at that time of year. Uh, I've got my Bible open to the book of Ruth here. And Ruth of course was a woman of Moab, not a Jew, who ended up being married, and not only married into the tribes of Israel, but, but uh, in a very special way she was married. And when you read Ruth uh, uh, chapter 3 verse 6, <clears throat> Ruth goes to the uh, threshing floor on the day of threshing. By the way, the harvest of the grain. That's another theme of Pentecost. Ruth happens at the time of the final harvest and so does Pentecost. It come, it's, it's, it's a harvest festival. And so she goes to the threshing floor and following the instructions of Naomi, she uh, laid down near Boaz. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, that is of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, laid her head down, came to pass at midnight. There it is. This happens, by the way, on Shavuot. That the man was afraid, turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And, and he said, Who art thou? And, and she answered, I am Ruth thine handmaid. Wow! Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And so uh, the rest of the story is that Ruth and Boaz were married. And of course here's the ending of the story. <clears throat> These are the generations of Pharaoh's 
Pharez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashim, Nashim begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, Boaz begot Obed, and Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. By grace, on the night of Pentecost, she became the great grandmother of King David. Hmm. And she wasn't even in the line of Israel. So, so what you have here is a harvest festival, Boaz the strong man, who is by the way a type of Christ, uh, Ruth an outsider who, who is taken into the lineage of Israel. She is the very symbol of grace in the Bible. The Gentile bride. Gentile bride, absolutely. And Naomi is a type of Israel. Sure. And so everywhere you look at Pentecost, it just absolutely shouts at the idea of God's grace, the fulfillment of His promises, the gifts, uh, everything. I mean, it's just amazing. Okay, now you just said the word shouts, and I've got to go <laughs> back to something in your article which the average Christian, believe me, has never heard. You know, there are a lot of people who believe that Rosh Hashanah is a type of the rapture. Right. That's the feast day when the Lord may return. Uh, because of the blowing of the shofar, which they equate to the trumpet sound. But take us back to Sinai, back in the Exodus, and the actual voice of God that came down from the mountain. Then take us into 1 Thessalonians and compare the trumpet of God. Well, it's fascinating, and I'm going to go back there right now. <clears throat> Exodus 19.19, 19, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. Now if you read this very carefully, verse 19 says that this trumpet that Moses heard was not a trumpet blown by an angel. It was not a musical instrument. <clears throat> it was not, and we think of a trumpet as a brass instrument. It was not that at all. It was the voice of God that sounded like a trumpet. And when you go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, you, you read exactly the same thing. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout and voice, the archangel, the trumpet shall sound. To me, it's the same identical event. The trumpet shall sound. And I know what you're aiming for here, Bob. I'm going back to <laughs> Revelation 4 again. And the voice says, come up hither. Yeah. A door opened in heaven and a voice right. said, come up hither. That is our call home. That voice heard by John in uh, Revelation chapter 4 is the voice of a trumpet and you want to say wow the Lord's voice calling His people home. Pentecost. It's all the same thing. Now I want you to summarize again what you shared with me before we shot the program together uh, as we were preparing for the program were all the different events that have happened on Pentecost and all the different uh, calendar dates and births and deaths and there's so many things that make us think that this is a type of the rapture. Well, you read them in this list, a, a great number of them, but as you go through the festival calendar, and let me start again with just going back to Passover. Uh, we noted in Colossians that the, the festivals are prophetic in nature. They are types. Passover is freedom freedom we have in Christ. He gave His life so that we might be free. Uh, unleavened bread. His body was broken for us so we might have communion with Him. First fruits. Uh, he was resurrected so that we might be resurrected. And then you count 50 days and you come to Pentecost. And, you, and Pentecost, by the way, <clears throat> is a very, very special time because it speaks of harvest and maturity. Well, the harvest was spoken of as the end of the age by Jesus. Now Bob, as you go on, here's a fascinating thing about the calendar, the festival calendar. From Pentecost until Rosh Hashanah, you enter into a, a kind of a low season. You enter into uh, a, a period of fasting called the three weeks. And then you enter into the month before Tishri the first, and the sounding of the trumpet <clears throat> with a time of doing penance, uh, of uh, inwardly uh, examining yourself in the light of uh, perhaps a coming judgment. And what happens next? Tishri 1, Rosh Hashanah. 
and Rosh Hashanah is called the, by the Jews the birthday of the world. Ten days later, Yom Kippur, in which one prostrates oneself before God and confesses one's sin. And so uh, you move into that, and then you come to the end. You come up to the 24th of Kislev. And that is an amazing uh, festival. The 24th of Kislev uh, commemorates the building of the temple. And so that, that's the last in the line of feasts, the feasts of Israel. They lay out a pattern of prophecy. How do you remember all these things? I've read your article at least five times in the magazine, <laughs> and I have to keep going back and rereading paragraph by paragraph. I guess it comes from 40 years of pastoring and studying the Bible. Well, here's the thing, Bob. It, the article that we have here in our June 2016 magazine says a whole lot more than I've had time to say in detail. But the thrust of it is this. It would appear that the timing of the rapture of the church could very likely be on a future Pentecost. And remember, Pentecost is called the festival without a date. When is Pentecost this year? Well, I think it's the 22nd. I don't think so. I uh, think it's the 12th. Oh, I see. You know what I did? June 12th. I, I gave him a chance to <laughs> correct me. <laughs> it's the festival without a date, Bob. You were checking to see if I was paying attention. I was checking attention. to see if you were paying attention. I'll go with that. And, but I want to tell you, it's a time when I start looking. Amen. Every year, I start this internal soul searching. You know, in... Uh, in looking at book, and by the way, Bob is very, very good at selecting books <clears throat> that uh, reflect our studies. He has found a beautiful book this time, The Pentecostal Rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ by Jack Langford. This book is a must read. It goes into much, much more detail than we've had time to do today. Uh, another one by David Brickner, Rich Robinson, called Christ in the Feast of Pentecost, a companion volume. Uh, will give you some real interesting studies uh, and, and kind of make you an expert on what we've been talking about. Well, when a book impresses you, that impresses me. And when you got a hold of uh, yeah. Jack Langford's book here, you just said, Bob, this guy really knows what he's talking he about. Does. Just a wonderful book. You can actually get the Pentecost package just twenty nine ninety five for both books and a copy of the Pentecost magazine where Gary's written this extensive article you can subscribe to the magazine for $19.95 a year for 12 issues. You can get a lifetime subscription for just $100, and you can get the publication every month. Absolutely. And by the way, Pentecost really is on the 12th, <laughs> but it's the festival without a date. June 12th. June the 12th of this year, and we'll be watching. You know, that's the way we always end the program. We'll be watching, so uh, you be watching too. I'm Gary Stearman. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter or follow us at facebook.com slash prophecywatchers. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.